Now I want you to open your Bibles, if you would please, to Isaiah 37 and verse 10. And this is still the second part of the message, Truths from a Heathen. And may I just remind you before I read the scripture, last week I brought a message from this same passage. And I pointed out the fact how that uh, God oftentimes uses even the heathen to speak truth. They may not know the truth. They may not believe the truth. They may not understand the significance of their words. And yet sometimes they speak truth, or at least something with great spiritual impact. Even Balaam, the false prophet, was used by God to give a wonderful prophecy concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. And then, of course, we understand that uh, Caiaphas, the high priest, also prophesied concerning Christ. He had no idea what he was saying, but he did so. And even Rabshakeh, who was a heathen, along with Sennacherib, his king, uh, gave some very strenuous <laughs> and godly advice in one sense of the word, although they were heathen. Because last week we, uh, they asked Hezekiah, what confidence is this wherein thou trustest? And so when you look today in Isaiah 37, uh, let's look just at verse 10. That's mainly our text today. Uh, Thus shall you speak to Hezekiah, king of Judah, saying, Let not thy God in whom thou trustest deceive thee, saying, Jerusalem shall not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Now, <clears throat> you have to remember this. A different passage? Yeah, something just jumped out. I've never seen it before. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's how you get to studying. <laughs> that's, that's exactly what happened to me when I, when I found this passage. It just jumped out at me. So... Uh, so you have to remember exactly where Hezekiah was. The defense cities all around Judah, and, and Judah had already been captured by Sennacherib. Uh, Hezekiah does not have a military sufficient to fight against Sennacherib. In fact, Rabshakeh, you remember, offered him 2,000 horses if he was able on his part to set riders on them. And so he's obviously incapable of defending himself and Jerusalem, and help from Egypt is not coming. And so uh, they ask, uh, what in the world is the confidence wherein you trust? And then they said, let not the God in whom you trust deceive you. Now the word deceive literally means to deceive or to beguile. So here are the implication of these words to Hezekiah. Ramshakeh is implying that God could not and would not protect either Hezekiah or Jerusalem. So they're saying, if you are convincing yourself by any stretch of the imagination that you are going to escape and that Jerusalem is not going to be captured, then the only God in whom you are trusting is deceiving you because that is your only hope at this particular time. So uh, he's saying, there's no help for you. You're going to fall into our hands. Jerusalem is going to be captured, and so are you. So when Ramshakeh then spoke these words to Hezekiah, let not thy God in whom thou trustest deceive thee, it was not just simply psychological warfare. It was not just simply a psyops, as we would call it. Surely they did wish to make Hezekiah doubt his God. That is true. And the reason they wished to make him doubt his God is because they wanted to leave him absolutely hopeless and absolutely helpless. But you have to remember this. Rabshakeh and Sennacherib were absolutely sure, they were absolutely positive that Jerusalem was going to fall in their hands. They'd conquered all the other cities. They'd conquered all the other towns and villages nearby. So you see the pride and the arrogance on the part of Rabshakeh and on the part of Sennacherib as well. So here's the big problem. They did not know the God in whom Hezekiah trusted. A major dividing line between the child of God and the heathen is simply this. The children of God know their heavenly Father, while the heathen and the pagans do not know Him. Now, let me explain something. They may have heard about Him. They may have read about Him. 
but they do not know him personally and they do not know him intimately. They are totally and completely ignorant of him. They're ignorant of his attributes. They're ignorant of his person. They're ignorant of his power. And then they callously liken him to their gods. In other words, the only thing that they would know about the one true and the living God is what they know about their own false gods. So, let me just show you. I want you to look in your Bibles, whole Isaiah 37, but look in your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 20. Here are some words that we need to look at and a situation that we need to consider. Because in 1 Kings chapter 20, Ben-Hadad, who is the king of Syria, has 32 kings to join him. And he's going to do battle with Ahab, king of Israel. So, Ben-Hadad is so absolutely confident that he's going to whip Ahab because Ahab has so few men and is so weak militarily. Can you imagine, just for one moment, the size of the army that Ben-Hadad must have had with 32 kings? And so, they're in his pavilion, the kings are, drinking themselves drunk. And if you look in verse 18, when some of the Israelites come out, notice if you would please, in fact, go back to verse 16, and they went out at noon, but Ben-Hadad was drinking himself drunk in the pavilions, he and the kings, the 30 and two kings had helped him. And the young men of the princes of the province as went out first, that is these young Israelites, and Ben-Hadad sent out, and they told him, saying, There are men come out of Samaria. Now watch this. And he said, Whether they be come out for peace, take them alive. Or whether they come out for war, take them alive. So it doesn't matter, he says, why they're coming out. If they want peace, wonderful. Capture them. If they want war, wonderful. Capture them. It doesn't matter. Just take them alive. So, <laughs> he's sitting there giving this order, and his men go out. And if you look in verse 19, So these young men of the princes of the provinces came out of the city, and the army which followed them, and they, that is the Israelites, slew every one his man, that is all the Syrians. And the Syrians fled, and Israel pursued after them. And Ben-Hadad, the king of Assyria, escaped on a horse with the horsemen. Now watch. And the king of Israel went out and smote the horses and the chariots and slew the Syrians with a great slaughter. So here's the situation now. Ben-Hadad with 32 kings is soundly defeated by Ahab with just a few men. I mean, they are absolutely trounced upon. So here's the question that you have to ask yourself. How did the Syrians explain their loss? Well, let me tell you. They explained their loss with a theological concept. They explained their loss based upon the theology that they held concerning their God. For instance, look in your Bibles, if you would please, verse 23. Here's what they said to Ben-Hadad. Well, they said, And the servants of the king of Syria said unto them, Their gods, that is the gods of Israel, their gods are the gods of the hills. Therefore they were stronger than we, but let us fight against them in the plain, and surely we will be stronger than they. Now, they did not understand the absolute sovereignty of God. Moreover, they did not understand that the one true and the living God controlled all aspects of life, and that He was and is omnipresent, omnipotent, and omniscient. Consequently, what they were doing was they were setting themselves up for another loss. So, if you look again, notice if you would please, uh, at verse 28. Verse 28, And there came a man of God, and spake unto the king of Israel, and said, Thus saith the Lord, Because the Syrians have said, The Lord is the God of the hills, but He is not the God of the valleys. Therefore will I deliver all this great multitude into thine hand, and you shall know that I am the Lord. Now, the prophet had already come to Ahab and said, You can mark it down. One year later they're going to come back. 
they're going to come back. But they explained their devastating loss by saying that, well, the Hebrews trusted in a God who happened to be the God of the hills. What we're going to do, we're going to fight him in the plains and the valleys. He's not the God there. He's not omnipotent. He's not omniscient. He's not omnipresent. He's not sovereign. And surely our gods will enable us to overcome them there. So, the heathen, although they may know something about gods, they only know something about their gods. They know nothing about the one true and the living God as He's revealed Himself in the Bible. Now let me tell you, the fatal error of fallen man is not only that he does not fear God, he does not know God. How can you fear someone that you do not know? It's impossible. So, I could introduce someone in this room that looks so weak and insignificant, and yet he could be a master martial artist and could take on everybody in this room. But if you do not know him and know his abilities and what he can do, you would say, well, he's a pushover. Well, it's the same thing with God. They have no idea who God is. They have no idea about Him. So consequently, what fallen man has done is this. He has erected for himself false gods in his ignorance, in his rejection, and in his denial of the one true of the living God, who has revealed himself in Jesus Christ. What fallen man has done is he has made a God of his own. And he is deceived by the God of his own making. Now, I want to show you something. I want you to follow me in Scripture. Turn, if you would, to Isaiah 44. And I want to read a rather lengthy passage, not too long. But I want you to see what God says about idols. And I want you to see the thinking of fallen man. Look in Isaiah 44, and we'll begin in verse 8. And we'll read through verse 20. So, watch. Isaiah 44, verse 8. God says, Fear ye not, neither be afraid. He's talking to His people. Have I not told thee from that time, and have declared it? Watch. You are even my witnesses. Now look what God says. Is there a God besides me? Yea, there is no God. I know not any. So God is saying, I'm the sovereign. I'm the only one. Now watch, verse 9. They that make a graven image are all of them vanity. And their delectable, delectable things shall not profit. And they are their own witnesses. They see not, nor know, that they may be ashamed. Who hath formed a god, or molten a graven image, that is profitable for nothing? Behold, all his fellows shall be ashamed, and the workmen they are of men. Let them all be gathered together, let them stand up, yea, they shall fear, and they shall be ashamed together. Now look what he says, The smith with the tongs both worketh in the coals, and fashioneth it with hammers, and worketh it with the strength of his arms. Yea, he is hungry, and his strength faileth. He drinketh water, and is faint. In other words, he's human. He's a man. Watch. The carpenter stretcheth out his line, or his rule. He marketh it out with a line. He fitteth it with planes. And he marketh it out with the compass, and maketh it after the figure of a man, according to the beauty of a man, that it may remain in his house. He heweth him down cedars, and taketh the cypress and the oak, which he strengtheneth for himself among the trees of the forest. He planteth an ash, and the rain doth nourish it. Then shall it be for a man to burn, and he will take thereof, and warm himself. Yea, he kindleth it, and baketh bread. Yea, he maketh a god, and worshipeth it. He maketh it a graven image, and falleth down thereunto. He burneth part thereof in the fire, with part thereof he eateth flesh. He roasteth roast and is satisfied, and he warmeth himself and says, Aha, I'm warm, I've seen the fire. And the residue thereof he maketh a god, even his graven image. He falleth down unto it and worshipeth it, and prayeth unto it and saith, Deliver me, for thou art my god. They have not known 
nor understood, for he has shut their eyes that they cannot see, and their hearts that they cannot hear. And none considers in his heart, neither is there any knowledge nor understanding to say, I have burned part of it in the fire. Yea, also I have baked bread upon the coals thereof. I have roasted flesh and eaten it. And shall I make the residue thereof an abomination, an idol? Shall I fall down to the stalk of a tree? Now watch verse 20. He feedeth on ashes. A deceived heart hath turned him aside, that he cannot deliver his soul, nor say, Is there not a lie in my right hand? So God is saying, here is the absolute stupidity of idolaters. Either a man has to make his own idol, or another man makes the own idol. I don't care how many images of Buddha you see or any of the other false gods. They're all man-made. And he says, here's a man that'll take a tree. He burns part of it. He warms himself. He cooks on it. Then the residue, he turns around and makes a, a god out of it and says, you're my god. You, you have to deliver him. Now, you and I think and say, well, that is absolute stupidity. Well, hang on. I want you to look in your Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 2. Jeremiah chapter 2 and verse 27. You see, men may call a stalk or a stone their father, but God says they're absolutely, totally deceived, and their God has deceived them. So notice Jeremiah 2 and verse 27. And by the way, uh, let's go back to verse 26. Hey, because he's talking to Israel. As a thief is ashamed when he is found, so is the house of Israel ashamed. They, their kings, their princes, and their priests, and their prophets, saying to a stock, Thou art my father, and to a stone thou hast brought me forth. For they have turned their back unto me, and not their face. But in the time of their trouble they will say, Arise and save us. So God says, look at this people. They're so stupid. They're so perverse. They're so rebellious. They fall down to a stone and say, You've begotten me into a stock. You're my father. But he said, Let them get in trouble. Now, of course, they're going to cry to me. Look at it in Jeremiah chapter 10 and verse 8. Jeremiah 10 and verse 8. Because here the Bible says exactly what idols are. Jeremiah 10 verse 8. But they are altogether brutish and foolish. The stock, that is that wooden stock, that idol, the stock is a doctrine of vanities. Many times in the Bible when you read about Israel turning to the vanities of the heathen. He's talking about the idols of the heathen. Now, if you will turn in your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 5, I want to show you what I consider one of the most humorous incidents in the Bible concerning an idol. In order to appreciate this, you have to understand that Israel had been defeated by the Philistines. And the ark of God had been taken, 1 Samuel chapter 5. And you remember, they took the ark and they put it in the house of their god Dagon, who is an idol. So I want you to see what happens when they put the ark in the house of Dagon. So 1 Samuel chapter 5 verse 1, And the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it from Ebenezer unto Ashdod, when the Philistines took the ark of God, they brought it into the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. And when they of Ashdod arose early on the morrow, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the earth before the ark of the Lord. Now watch what happens. And they took Dagon and set him up in his place again. Well, that's their hearts. Verse 4, And when they arose early on the morrow morning, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord, and the head of Dagon, and both the palms of his hands were cut off upon the threshold. Only the stump of Dagon was left to, them, to him. Therefore neither the priest of Dagon, nor any that come into Dagon's house, tread upon the threshold of Dagon in Ashdod unto this day. Now I want you to stop and think about that. 
Here are the Philistines, they're worshiping Dagon. The Ark of the Covenant is brought in, and Dagon falls in front of it. Well, they go back in and they help him back up. The next morning they come in and he's fallen down, his head's cut off, palms of hands cut, nothing but a stump there. Now, you would stop and think. The Philistines knew in one sense of the power of God because the Hebrews had already come in and conquered the land. And even when the Hebrews were being defeated in 1 Samuel chapter 4, the Hebrews said, let us send for the ark that it may save us. Not the God of the ark, but the ark. So they were trusting in the ark instead of the God of the ark. And when the ark came into the camp, then the Hebrews shouted a great shout, and the Philistine says, Oh, what in the world is this? This is nothing but horror and terror for us. The God of the Hebrews has come into the camp. They knew the power of God. They knew that because they had been defeated by that same one true and the living God. And now their God has fallen down broken. You would think that anybody one eye and half sense would put two and two together and say, hmm, our God must not be too much of a God. We have to help him back up. He can't even help himself. And he loses his head and he loses his hands at the feet of the God of Israel. You would tend to think that people would say, hey, wait a minute. We're serving the wrong God. But the truth of the matter is, no. They continued to believe in day God and their God in whom they trusted deceived them. So you have to ask yourself this question. Why would anyone trust in a God who could not help him or deliver him? I want you to look in 1 Chronicles chapter 14. I preached a message from this passage several years back in 1 Chronicles chapter 14. And I think the title of the message was, It's Time to Leave Our False Gods. And I took it from this passage, 1 Chronicles chapter 14. Let's begin there with verse 9. And the Philistines came and spread themselves in the valley of Rephaim. And David inquired of God, saying, Shall I go up against the Philistines, and wilt thou deliver them into mine hand? And the Lord said unto him, Go up, for I will deliver them into thine hand. So they came up to Baal Perazim, and David smote them there. Then David said, God hath broken in upon mine enemies by mine hand like the breaking forth of waters. Therefore they called the name of that place Baal Perazim. And when they had left their gods there, that is the Philistines, when they had left their gods there, David gave a commandment, and they were burned with fire. So, so they brought their gods to protect them and to give them victory. The gods didn't protect them and didn't give them victory, so they left them there. Well, it's time to leave them when they are absolutely worthless. Now, I want you to turn right over, or back I should say, to 2 Kings chapter 16. 2 Kings chapter 16. I want you to understand the depravity and the rebellion a fallen man. <laughs> Ahaz was the king of Israel at this particular time. The king of Syria had attacked him. He was unable military to fight off the king of Syria. And so what he did was he sent to tiglath Pileser, the king of Assyria, gave him all kind of wealth and said, come and help me. So tiglath Pileser now, king of Assyria, comes and conquers Syria. Damascus is the capital. So Ahaz, the king of Israel, goes to Damascus to meet tiglath Pileser. So watch what happens. Second Kings chapter 16 and verse 10. And King Ahaz went to Damascus to meet tiglath Pileser, king of Assyria, and saw an altar that was at Damascus, 
And King Ahaz sent to Urijah the priest the fashion of the altar and the pattern of it according to all the workmanship thereof. Now this was an altar in Syria. And Urijah the priest built an altar according to all that King Ahaz had sent from Damascus. So Urijah the priest made it against or before King Ahaz came from Damascus. While he was up there, he made it, he finished it. And when the king was come from Damascus, the king saw the altar, and the king approached to the altar and offered thereon. Now, please understand, this is not God's altar. This is an altar from Damascus, from the Syrians. Verse 13, And he burned his burnt offering and his meat offering and poured his drink offering and sprinkled the blood of his peace offerings upon the altar. And he brought also the brazen altar which was before the Lord from the forefront of the house from between the altar and the house of the Lord and put it on the north side of the altar. And, the, and King Ahaz commanded Urijah the priest, saying, Upon the great altar burn the morning burnt offering, and the evening meat offering, and the king's burnt sacrifice, and his meat offering, with the burnt offering of all the people of the land, and their meat offering, and their drink offerings, and sprinkle upon it all the blood of the burnt offering, and all the blood of the sacrifice, and the brazen altar shall be for me to inquire by. This is my special altar. Thus did Urijah the priest according to all that King Ahaz commanded him. And you go on and see how King Ahaz then perverted and destroyed uh, the house of God, the temple that had been built. Now, the thing is this. Siri had been defeated. tiglath Pileser had wiped them out. And so Ahaz sees this altar and he thinks... Wow, this is beautiful. I, I need one just like this to worship by. Have you ever stopped to think that just because someone thinks that something is beautiful does not make it scriptural and right? You look at some of the pagan temples, they are exquisite. They are beautiful, but they're not biblical. They're not right. You think that Ahaz was stupid? <laughs> I can show you a man in the Bible that was even more stupid than Ahaz, Amaziah, another king. In fact, God even called him on his stupidity. For instance, look in 2 Chronicles chapter 25. 2 Chronicles 25. God challenged him on his stupidity. The very fact that Amaziah refused to listen to God indicated that God was going to destroy him. So watch. 2 Chronicles 25, and let's begin reading there with verse 14. Now, by the way, Amaziah had just defeated the Edomites. He had just won the victory. So watch. And it came to pass after that Amaziah was come from the slaughter of the Edomites, that he brought the gods of the children of Seir and set them up to be his gods and bowed down himself before them and burned incense to them. Wherefore the anger of the Lord was kindled against Amaziah. And he sent unto him a prophet which said unto him, why hast thou sought after the gods of the people which could not deliver their own people out of thine hand? And it came to pass as he talked with him that the king said unto him, that is to the prophet, Art thou made of the king's counsel? Forbear! Why shouldest thou be smitten? In other words, if you don't shut up, I'll kill you. Watch. He said, Forbear! Why should thou be smitten? And notice, if you would, what he said. Then the prophet forbear and said, I know that God hath determined to destroy thee, because thou hast done this, and hast not hearkened unto my counsel. Isn't that amazing? So here's a king now that has gone and defeated the Edomites and saw their false gods and took them then to be his gods. Now, I want you to stop and think with me. Rabshakeh said, Let not thy God in whom thou trustest deceive thee. <clears throat> there may be a few in America that would actually bow down to idols. And I know 
that some of the cults and sects have their idols. I understand that. So there are a few in America that would do that. But most Americans, by and large, would never actually bow down to an idol. I don't care if it's made of solid gold or silver or wood or stone. Because by this time, most Americans would consider bowing down to an idol not only idolatry, but they would consider it as gross, uncouth, and heathenistic. Right? We would never, ever do anything like that. However, however, we do not object to worshiping a God of our imagination. And what we do not understand is this, that the word image comes from the word imagination. You cannot make an image without first imagining that image. Everything begins in the mind. It's just like I said, cars do not begin in a factory. Cars begin in an engineer's mind. And he then draws everything out on a piece of paper. And once it goes through all the process and that is approved, then that image that he has imagined and drawn out goes into the factory and they produce it. So everything basically starts with our mind. When you and I think wrongly and unbiblically and unscripturally concerning the one true and the living God who's revealed himself in Scripture, to that extent we are idolaters. To that extent we are idolaters. Now listen carefully. The only true God that exists is the God that has revealed Himself in Holy Scripture. And He is exactly as He has revealed Himself. He is not as we wish Him to be. He is not as we hope He is to be. He is not what we think He is. He is not what we desire Him to be. He is what He has revealed in Holy Scripture. So most people then are idolaters in the sense that they worship a God of their own imagination. Now let me show you. We need to consider what the New Testament says about imaginations. Our Lord warned us. So if you'll look in your Bibles, first of all, to the book of Romans chapter 1. Everyone knows this passage. You understand it. But let me just show you where all this actually began. Notice in Romans chapter 1, and let's begin reading there with verse 21. Romans 1, verse 21. Watch carefully. The Bible says, because that when they knew God, that is, they had knowledge of Him at one point, because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, that is, they did not believe Him, they would not worship Him. Well, when they did not believe God and when they would not worship Him as God, what happened? Neither were they thankful, here's what happened, but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like unto corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Now, here's my question. Where did all of the idolatry or all of the idols begin? And the answer is in the imagination. They became vain in their imaginations, and they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, and to birds, and four-footed beasts, and creeping things. It all starts in the mind. And of course, if you look in verse 25, who changed the truth of God into a lie, 
and worship and serve the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. So, all of our idolatry begins in the mind. That is why most Christians, professing Christians, are content with the God that they have in their mind. And I have heard, I have heard professing Christians make statements like this, but I know God is not like that. Mm. Or my God would never do something like that. Really? Your God probably would not, but the God of Scripture would. <laughs> because the only God that they have is the God of their own imagination and not the God of the Bible. Now, let me show you another passage. Look in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 10 at verses 4 and 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 at verses 4 and 5. I want you to follow with me. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4. Paul says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Now, let me just stop. The Apostle Paul is talking about a warfare, but he's not talking about a carnal or a fleshly warfare. He's talking about a spiritual warfare. But notice he said, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Now, I want you to stop and think about a stronghold. What is your stronghold? Your stronghold is your place of defense. It's where you hold out. So, if that cabinet was over here, and someone came through that door firing a pistol, I would jump behind that cabinet. That cabinet now becomes my stronghold. It's my place of defense, okay? Now I want you to watch this. Look what he said in verse 4. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. You want to know where man's stronghold is? Here it is. Casting down imaginations. And every high thing, or literally every high thought, that exalted itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So what is it that we must cast down? It is our imaginations. We cannot imagine God to be as He is not. When we do, we are guilty of idolatry. The God that we manufacture in our minds is the God that deceives us because He's not real. He's not any more real than an idol. I want you to go back in your Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 13. Jeremiah chapter 13. And look, if you would, at what God says. And, and He's talking about Israel. Jeremiah 13. God has commanded Jeremiah to take a new girdle and bear it by the river Euphrates. I'm not going into all that right now, but look what he said concerning his people, Judah and Jerusalem particularly. He said in verse 10, this evil people, talking about Judah and Jerusalem now, verse 9, thus saith the Lord, after this manner will I mar the pride of Judah and the great pride of Jerusalem. This evil people which refuse to hear my words, which walk in the imagination of their heart, and walk after other gods to serve them and to worship them shall even be as this girdle which is good for nothing. Now notice if you would what he said. This evil people who number one refuse to hear my words, who number two walk after the imagination of their heart, and number three the imagination of their heart causes them to walk after other gods to serve them and to worship them. Isn't that amazing? So God is telling us that oftentimes, yes, the God in whom we trust does deceive us because the God in whom we trust is not necessarily the one true and the living God who's revealed Himself in Jesus Christ. Moreover, we're equally deceived 
when we think that we can sin against God and escape His judgment. I, I know of individuals who think that somehow God's never going to judge them. God's never going to destroy them. But what is true individually is also true familially. It's also true ecclesiastically. It's also true nationally. Alice and I passed a church building this morning. And uh, all across the churchyard was, were signs that said, God bless America, God bless America, God bless America. And I looked at Alice and I said, why should Amer God bless America? America does not bless God. We've turned our backs upon God. We've despised Him. See, the, the problem is this. What we've done is we've manufactured a God of our own imagination. Let me point out that when we violate the law of God, and basically what we've done in this country is we've forsaken God's law. But when we violate the law of God, we are idolaters. The very first commandment is, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. You cannot violate any of God's uh, law. You cannot transgress against God without first violating the very first commandment. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. I don't care what you do. When you sin against God, you have already violated the first commandment because you have dethroned God and enthroned yourself. And you've said basically, I don't care what God says. I want what I want. And I'm going to do what I want to do. A good example of this is found in the 10th commandment. The 10th commandment is thou shalt not covet. Now God goes on to tell us in that commandment a number of things that we're not to covet. We're not to covet our neighbor's wife, uh, his maidservants, his manservants, his oxen, his asses, or anything that's our neighbor's. But the principle is very simple. Thou shalt not covet. I don't know if you've ever thought about the extent of covetousness or not. But if Steve had a brand new four-wheel drive truck. And I looked at that thing and I said, ah, man, I like that. I'd really like to have that. I wish he'd give it to me. Hmm. Ah, he won't give it to me. Maybe I can steal it. <laughs> you, 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 know, you see, you see where, where I'm going with this? You know what the Bible says in Colossians 3 and verse 5? Mortify therefore your members which are upon earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. So when I covet that truck, I've already committed idolatry. Why? Because I've denied God who said, Thou shalt not commit a, a idolatry, or thou shalt not covet. So you cannot sin against God without violating the very first commandment. Now, I want to show you what God says about idols. And then I'm going to make some applications. I want you to turn in your Bibles, first of all, to Psalm 115. Psalm 115. I really, at one time, started to enlarge upon this, but I thought I'd save that for another message. But look in Psalm 115. And let's begin reading there with verse 1. Psalm 115, verse 1. Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name give glory for thy mercy and for thy truth's sake. Wherefore should the heathen say, Where is now their God? Now notice the sovereignty of our God. But our God is in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. This is our God. He's sovereign. He does as He pleases. Watch verse 4. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes have they, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Noses have they, but they smell not. They have hands, but they handle not. Feet have they, but they walk not. Neither speak they through their throat. They that make them are like unto them, so is everyone that trusteth in them. 
Now wait a minute. They that make them are likened to them, so is everyone that trusteth in them. What is an idol? He's dead and dumb. God said, if you make one, you're dead and dumb. If you trust in one, you're dead and dumb. Look in your Bible, so Psalm 135. You'll see basically the same truth, but I'll point something else out. Look in Psalm 135, verse 15. Here's what God says. The idols of the heathen are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes have they, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Neither is there any breath in their mouths. They that make them are like unto them, so is everyone that trusteth in them. Wow. You know, it really gets worse <laughs> than being dead and dumb. Do you know that one of the words for an idol in the Bible is the Hebrew word gilulim? You look up the Hebrew word in the lexicon and you will find that the word actually means dung balls. What? Dung balls. That's what an idol is. That's what God refers to an idol as a ball of dung. You remember the Valley of Gehenna around Jerusalem? That's where all the trash was, all the dead bodies, all the scum, all the filth which was a picture of hell, which our Lord used. And that basically is what hell is. Hell is nothing more than the outhouse for the dung balls of this life, those that worship idols. That's what he said. They that make them are likened to them, so is everyone that trusteth in them. So yeah, when Rabshakeh says, let not the God and whom you trust deceive you. He was speaking a truth that we need to consider. Ah, an idol is a useless, worthless, man-made piece of garbage regardless of who made it and what it was made from. The only value that it would possess would be its workmanship and the materials that are in it. That's it. It does not possess life. It cannot give life. It cannot protect. It cannot provide. It is dumb. It is dead. And so is everyone who makes them and everyone who trusts them. A God of your imagination is of no more use than an idol because it's not God. The only God that is, is the God that has revealed Himself in Holy Scripture. Now, I want you to go back in your Bibles to Isaiah 37. I want you to listen to some applications. The first one is this. And I think most of you would agree with this. It's easy, oftentimes, to give counsel and advice. And sometimes it's difficult to follow your own counsel and advice. Mm -hmm. So what did Sennacherib send Rabshakeh to Hezekiah to say? He sent him to say, let not the God in whom you trust deceive you. Wow. Guess what? The God in whom Sennacherib trusted deceived him. His God was Nishrach. If you will look in Isaiah 37 and verse 38, the Bible says this. In fact, let's read verse 37. Isaiah 37, 37. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and went and returned and dwelt at Nineveh. And it came to pass as he was worshiping in the house of Nisroch, his God, that Adramelech and Sherezer, his sons, smote him with the sword. And they escaped in the land of Armenia. And Esarhaddon, his son, reigned in his stead. Wow. Do you realize he ended up trusting in a false god? His false god deceived him, and he died at the hands of his own sons and the house of his false god. Hmm. Well, he sent word to Hezekiah, don't let the god in whom you trust deceive you. He never followed his own counsel or his own advice. 
and he died in idolatry. Now, I want you to think about this second application. When one refuses to bow to the sovereign God who has revealed himself in Jesus Christ, deception is absolute and unavoidable. Let me say that again. When one refuses to bow to the one true and the living God, the sovereign God who has revealed himself in Jesus Christ, then deception is absolute and unavoidable. When you reject truth, you're only open to error. When one denies truth, the only thing left is deception. Have you ever stopped to ask, what is the source of deception? How can a man be deceived? There are plenty of answers, I'm sure. But I'm going to give you two answers. First of all, a man can be deceived by his own wicked heart. Jeremiah 17, verse 9, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? So our hearts can deceive us. In fact, in the book of Obadiah, chapter 1 and verse 3, God said to those people, The pride of thine heart had deceived thee. In other words, you've got yourself up here in the cleft of the rock. You think you can't be brought down? Oh, I got news for you, said God. I can bring you down. The pride of your heart has deceived you. So you can be deceived by your own wicked heart. But secondly, you can be deceived by the sovereign God of heaven and earth who, according to the principle of the law of retribution, sends you that deception. It's called the lex talionis, the law of retribution, where God makes the punishment fit the crime. So, if you do not want His truth, He will see that you believe a lie. If you do not want His word, He will see that you believe error. Look in your Bibles, two passages. First of all, Isaiah 66, and look at verse 4. Isaiah 66 and verse 4. Look what God says. He's talking about uh, people who won't listen. In fact, let, let, let's begin reading verse 1. Look what he said. Isaiah 66 verse 1. Thus saith the Lord, the heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you build unto me? And where is the place of my rest? In other words, you try to build something just for me, you're going to run out of materials. I made it all. For all those things hath mine hand made, and all those things have been, saith the Lord. But to this man will I look, even to him that is a poor and of a contrite spirit, and trembleth at my word. He that killeth an ox is if he slew a man. He that sacrificeth a lamb is if he cut off a dog's neck. He that offereth an oblation is if he offered swine's blood. That's because they do it in rebellion. He that burneth incense is if he blessed an idol. Yea, they have chosen their own ways. Watch now. They've chosen their own ways, and their soul delighteth in their abominations, not in God. Look what God says. I also will choose their delusions and will bring their fears upon them, because when I called, none did answer. When I spake, they did not hear, but they did evil before mine eyes, and chose that in which I delighted not. Isn't that amazing? God said, you don't want to believe me? Fine, I'll choose your delusions. I'll bring upon you your own fears. And if you will turn very quickly to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Look if you would beginning there with verse 10. 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 10. The Bible says, And for this cause, watch, for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion. Uh, verse 10, let's go back to verse 10. I, I miss verse 10. And with all deceivableness of, of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. In other words, they didn't want the truth. Now watch. And for this cause, because they did not want truth, for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. That they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. 
Why did God send them a strong delusion? Because they hated His truth. They refused Him. So listen to me very carefully. When God says, through Rabshakeh, let not the God in whom you trust deceive you. It's a principle. And we better determine who is the God that we trust in. We better determine that He is the one true and the living God who's revealed Himself in Jesus Christ because there is no other God. God Himself said, I know not any. And if God doesn't know any other God, very obviously we don't know any other God. This also, also should tell you where most of the people are at in America today. They're trusting in a God of their imagination. And they're deceived by their own God. And like Sennacherib, unless God opens their eyes and gives them repentance and faith, they will die in their deceit. Let not the God in whom you trust deceive you. I'm so thankful I trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and in Him alone. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we bow to Thee. We thank You for Your Word, for Your truth, for Your admonition. Give us grace that we may serve Thee acceptably with reverence and godly fear. In Thy name we pray. Amen.